Chapter 7 Aias fights Hector. Prince Hector said no more, but quickly passed out through the gate with his brother Paris. Both were eager for the fight, and to the expectant Trojans, their reappearance was as welcome as a breeze from heaven to sailors, numbed in leg and arm by the toil of a smiting the sea water with their blades of polished pine. A victim fell at once to each. Paris killed Menestheus, who lived at Arne, and the son of King Erethuus, the mace man, and the ox-eyed lady Philomedusa. Hector, with his sharp spear, hit Ioneus in the neck under the bronze rim of his helmet and brought him down. Meanwhile, Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, the Lycian captain, casting a spear across the crowd, struck Iphinonus, son of Dexius, on the shoulder, just as he was mounting behind his fast mares. He fell from his chariot to the ground and crumpled up. When the bright-eyed goddess Athena saw them slaughtering Argives in this fierce assault, she sped down from the peaks of Olympus to sacred Ilium. But Apollo, who desired a Trojan victory, saw her from Pergamus and started out to intercept her. They met by the oak tree, and King Apollo, son of Zeus, at once accosted Athena. Daughter of almighty Zeus, he said, why have you come down from Olympus in such haste? With what high purpose in your mind? Since the destruction of the Trojans moves you not at all, I take it that you have come to throw your weight into the scales and make the Danans win. But listen to me, I have a better plan. Let us stop the fighting for the moment. Another day they can fight again and go on till they reach their goal in Ilium, since your goddess will not be happy till you have raised this city to the ground. So be it, archer king, said Athena of the flashing eyes. That is what I too had in mind when I came from Olympus to visit the battlefield. But how do you propose to stop the men from fighting? King Apollo, son of Zeus, replied, We could rouse the fighting spirit in horse-taming Hector and make him challenge one of the Danans to mortal combat. The bronze-clad Lenge, the bronze-clad Achaeans would be on their metal and put up a champion to fight a duel with Prince Hector. This was Apollo's plan, and Athena, goddess of the flashing eyes, made no demur. Priam's son, Helenus, was to divine what these gods had agreed to, and he went straight to his brother Hector. Prince Hector, he said, Will you, in your wisdom, allow yourself to be guided by your brother? I suggest that you should make the Trojans and Achaeans sit down and challenge an Argive champion to meet you man to man. You need have no fears for your life. Your time has not yet come. I have this from the deathless gods themselves. Hector was delighted. He stepped out into no man's land and, grasping his spear by the middle, thrust back the Trojan lines. They all sat down, and Agamemnon made the Achaean soldiers do the same. Athena and Apollo of the silver bow also sat down in the form of vultures on the tall oak sacred to Aegis bearing Zeus. 
They enjoyed the sight of all these Trojan and Achaean warriors sitting there on the plain, rank upon rank, bristling with shields, helmets, and spears, like the darkened surface of the sea when the west wind begins to blow and ripples spread across it. Hector stood between the two armies and said, Trojans and Achaeans, men at arms, hear a proposal that I wish to make. Zeus, from his high seat in heaven, has not allowed our truce to last. It is clear that he means us all to go on suffering till the day when you bring down the towers of Troy, or succumb to us yourselves by your much-traveled ships. Now, you have in your army the finest men of all Achaea. Is one of these preferred to fight me? If so, let him step forward among his friends as your champion against Prince Hector. And here are the conditions I lay down, with Zeus for witness. If your man kills me with his long pointed spear, he can strip me of my arms and take them to your hollow ships, but he must let them bring my body home, so that the Trojans and their wives may burn it in the proper manner. If Apollo lets me win, I will kill your man and kill your man. I shall strip his armor off and bring it into sacred Ilium, where I shall hang it on the wall of the archer king's shrine, but I shall send back his corpse to your well-found ships, so that the long-haired Achaeans may give him burial rites and make a mound above him by the broad hellspond. Then one day some future traveler sailing by in his good ship across the wine dark sea will say, this is the monument of some warrior of an earlier day who was killed in single combat by illustrious Hector. Thus my fame will be kept alive forever. Hector's speech was received by the enemy in silence. They were ashamed to refuse his challenge, but shrank from accepting it. At last, Menelaus, after many an inward struggle, rose to his feet and reproached them bitterly. What does this mean, you women of Achaea? I cannot call you men who used to be so ready with your threats. Not a single Danon willing to meet Hector. This is infamy. This is an utter degradation. Very well, then, sit there and rot, the whole crowd of you inglorious cowards to a man. And I will arm and fight him myself. The issue lies with the gods above. He said no more, but began to put on his splendid armor. And that, Menelaus, would have been the end of you at Hector's hands since he was the better man by far, if the Achaean kings had not leapt up and held you back, and if Atreides himself, imperial Agamemnon, had not seized you by the right hand and restrained you. You are mad, my lord Menelaus, he cried. There is no call for you to do this foolish thing. Withdraw! However mortifying it may be, do not let ambition make you fight a better man. You would not be the only one who has quailed before Prince Hector, son of Priam. Even Achilles feared to meet him in the field of honor. And Achilles is a better man than you by far. So go back now and sit down among your men, and the Achaeans will find someone else to fight for them against this man. He may be fearless and eager for his fill of trouble, but I think that even Hector 
will be glad to take it easy if he comes away alive from the stern ordeal he has asked for. In the face of his brother's wise remonstrances, Menelaus gave way, and with great relief his attendants took the armor from his shoulders. Then Nestor rose to his feet and addressed the Argives. This is enough, he said. To make Achaea weep, how Peleus, the old charioteer, would grieve Peleus, the great orator and commander of the Myrmidons, who took such delight when I stayed with him once in finding out for me the parentage and pedigree of every Argive. If it came to his ears that those same men were now all cowering before Hector, he would lift up his hands to the gods and beg them to let the spirit leave his flesh and go down to the house of Hades. Ah, Father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo, if only I could be as young as I was when the Pelian levies were fighting with the Arcadian spearmen at the swift river Celadon, below the Arcanian walls of Phia, by the streams of Irdanus. We were challenged by their best man, Eurythalian. He was like a god, and he carried on his shoulders the armor of King Arathuas, the great Arathuas who was surnamed the Mace Man by his compatriots and their girdled wives, because he never fought with a bow or a long spear, but used to break the enemy ranks with an iron mace. Lycurgus killed him, not by superior strength, but by a stratagem. He caught him in a narrow pass with his iron mace, could not save him. Before the mace man could bring it into play, Lycurgus was on him. He pierced him through the middle with his spear and brought him crashing to the ground on his back. Then he stripped him of the armor that brazen Ares had given him and afterwards wore it himself when he went into battle. Later, when Lycurgus had grown old in his palace, he let his squire, Erethalion, wear it. And so it came about that Erethalion challenged our champions in Arathuas' armor, and no one dared to take the challenge up. They were all thoroughly scared. But the spirit of adventure worked within me, and I had the hardihood to take him on, though I was the youngest of them all. So we fought, and Athena gave me the victory. He was the tallest and strongest man I have ever killed. He looked like a giant as he lay sprawling there in all his breadth and height. Ah, if only I were still as young, with all my powers intact. Then Hector of the flashing helmet would soon have his fight. As it is, I see before me the best men in all Achaea, and not one that has the will to stand up to Hector. The old man's reproaches brought nine men to their feet. Agamemnon, king of men, was the first to spring up. He was followed by the mighty Diomedes, son of Tydeus, and these by the two Aeantes, full of martial valor, and these again by Idomeneus and Idomeneus's squire, Meriones, a peer of the man-killing war god, and these by Eurypylus, a yeoman's high-born son. Thaus, son of Andraemon, got up too, and so did the good Odysseus. When all these had volunteered to fight Prince Hector, 
the Gerenian horseman Nestor rose again and said, You must decide by lot who is to have the honor, for the chosen man will not only render a service to Achaean arms, but reap a rich reward in his own heart if he escapes alive from the stern ordeal that awaits him. Each of them marked his own lot and cast it into the helmet of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, while the troops raised their hands to the gods and prayed. Father Zeus, they said, looking up into the broad sky, let it be Aias or Diomedes or the king of golden Mycenae himself. As they prayed, Nestor, the Gerenian charioteer, shook the helmet, and Aeaeus, Lot, leapt out, the very one they had hoped for. A herald carried it round the circle from left to right, showing it to each of the Achaean chieftains, and each in turn denied it when he failed to recognize his mark. At last, in the course of his tour, the herald with the lot came to the man who had marked it and put it in the helmet, illustrious Aeaeus himself. Aeaeus reached out, the herald came up to him and put the lot in his hand. Aeaeus recognized his mark and rejoiced. He threw the lot on the ground at his feet and said, My friends, the lot is mine, and I am delighted, for I think I shall defeat Prince Hector. I only ask you, while I am arming for the fight, to pray to Zeus, the royal son of Kronos, but let your prayers be silent, so that the Trojans may not overhear you, or pray aloud. We are afraid of nobody whatever. No one is going to have his way with me and make me run, either by brute force or by skill. After all, I hope I too can fight and was not born and bred a fool in Salamis. So they prayed to King Zeus, the son of Kronos. They looked up into the broad sky and said, Father Zeus, you that rule from Mount Ida, most glorious and great, grant Aeaeus a triumphant victory. But if you love Hector too and wish him well, let neither man be beaten and the fight be drawn. While they prayed, Aeaeus was putting on his flashing bronze. When all his armor was slung on, he sailed out like the monstrous Ares, when he joins embattled armies, hurled at each other by the son of Kronos in soul-destroying hate. Thus the gigantic Aeaeus, bulwark of Achaea, rose and went into battle, with a smile on his grim face, brandishing his long-shadowed spear as he strode forward. The Argives, when they saw him, were overjoyed, and there was not a Trojan whose knees did not tremble. Even Hector's heart fluttered in his breast, but it was too late for him to turn tail and slink back among his men. He was the challenger. And now Aeaeus drew near, carrying a shield and like a tower made of bronze and seven layers of leather. Tychius, the master courier who lived at Hyle, had made this glittering shield for him with the hides of seven big bulls, which he overlaid with an eighth layer of bronze. Holding this shield before his breast, Telamonian Aeaeus went right up to Hector before halting 
to defy him. Hector, he said, you are now going to discover in single combat what sort of champions the Danans have at their disposal, even when they cannot count, and Achilles, the lion-hearted breaker of men. At the moment, he is lying idle by his beaked seagoing ships, nursing a quarrel with Agamemnon, our commander-in-chief. But, for all that, we have men who can stand up to you. Yes, plenty of them. So take the first cast and start the fight. To this the great Hector of the flashing helmet answered, Prince Aeaeus, royal son of Telamon, do not try to scare me like a feeble child or a woman who knows nothing about warfare. To me, battle and slaughter are familiar things. I know well enough how to swing my toughened oxhide shield to right and left the mark. To my mind of the seasoned warrior, I know how to dash in when the chariots are on the move, and in close fighting I know all the steps of the war god's dance. But enough. Seeing the man you are, I do not want to play a sniper's part and steal a shot at you. So watch me cast, and may my cast go home. With this, he poised his long shadowed javelin and cast. He struck the formidable sevenfold shield of Aeaeus in its bronze metal sheath the eighth and outermost layer. The untiring bronze tore through six layers, but it was held up by the seventh hide. Then royal Aeaeus, in his turn, launched his long-shadowed spear. The heavy weapon struck the round shield of Priam's son. It pierced the gleaming shield forced its way through the ornate cuirass and pressing straight on toward the tunic on Hector's flank. But he had swerved and so avoided death. And now the pair, when each had pulled his long spear out, fell on each other like flesh-eating lions or like wild boars whose strength is not to be despised. Hector struck Aeaeus with a spear on the center of his shield, but the bronze did not break through. The stout shield turned its point. Then Aeaeus, leaping in, caught Hector on the shield. Hector was brought up short, and the spear passed clean through his shield with force enough left to reach his neck and bring the dark blood gushing out. Yet even so, Hector of the flashing helmet did not give up the fight. He drew back a little, and with his great hand picked up a large and jagged piece of black rock that was lying on the ground, hurled it at Aeaeus' formidable seven-fold shield, and struck it in the middle on the boss making the bronze ring out. But Aeaeus then picked up a bigger rock, which he swung and hurled at Hector with such tremendous force that the great boulder crumpled his shield and swept him off his feet. Hector jammed in the shield, lay stretched on his back, but Apollo quickly had him up again. And now they would have closed and hacked at one another with their swords, but for the heralds, those ambassadors of Zeus and men, a pair of whom, Telthibias on the Achaean side and Ideas on the Trojans, had the wisdom to come up and intervene. They raised their staves between the combatants and Ideas, a herald of ripe experience, acting as their spokesman, said, Dear sons, 
give up now and break off the fight. Zeus, the cloud gatherer, loves you both, and you are both fine spearmen. We all of us know that. Also, it is nearly dark, another good reason for stopping. Idaeus, Telamonian Aeus answered, it was Hector who asked for this duel. Tell him to call it off. If he makes the first move, I will take my cue from him. Aeus, said the great Hector of the flashing helmet, you are big, strong, and able, and the best spearman on your side. Admitting that, I suggest we cease fighting for the day, for we can always meet again and go on till the powers above decide between us. Also, the light is failing. We should do well to take the hint. The Achaeans would be very glad to see you back at their ships, your own friends and followers above all, while I should get a warm welcome in King Priam's city from the Trojans and the Trojan ladies in their trailing gowns, assembled for thanksgiving to the gods on my behalf. But first, let us exchange gifts of honor, so that it may be said by Trojans and Achaeans alike that we two fought each other tooth and nail, but presently were reconciled and parted friends. With this he gave Aeus his silver-studded sword, which he handed over with its scabbard and well-cut baldric, and Aeus gave Hector his brilliant purple belt. So the two parted. Aeus went back into the Achaean lines, while Hector rejoined the Trojan forces. His men were delighted when they saw him return to them alive and whole, safe from the fury and the unconquerable hands of Aeus. They escorted him back to the city like one they had given up for dead. Meanwhile, on the other side, the Achaean men-at-arms conducted Aeus to King Agamemnon, elated by his victory. When they reached the royal huts, Agamemnon, king of men, offered a five-year-old bull on their behalf to the almighty son of Kronos. They flayed and prepared it by cutting up the carcass and deftly chopping it into small pieces. These they pierced with spits, roasted carefully, and then withdrew from the fire. Their work done and the meal prepared, they fell to with a good will on the food, which all shared alike, though the noble sum of Atreus, imperial Agamemnon, paid Aeus the honor of helping him to the long chine of the beast. When their thirst and hunger were satisfied, a discussion was opened by the nobleman Nestor, who had a proposal to lay before them. His wisdom had often proved itself in the past. He was their loyal counselor, and it was in this spirit that he now rose and addressed them. My lord Atreides, and you other chieftains of the long-haired people of Achaea. We have had many losses. The cruel war god has darkened the banks of Scamander with his blood of our dead, whose souls have gone down to Hades. I suggest, therefore, that at dawn you should announce a truce. Then let us get to work together cart the bodies in here with oxen and mules, and burn them not far from the ships, arranging in each case for friends of the dead to bring the bones home to their children when we return to our own country. Over the pyre, let us make them a single borrow with such material 
as the plain provides. Then with this mound for a base, let us quickly build high walls to protect the ships and ourselves with strong gates let into them, leaving carriage away for the chariots. And a little way outside, let us dig a deep trench parallel with the walls to serve as an obstruction to chariots and infantry in case the Trojans get out of hand some day and press us hard. Such was Nestor's scheme, to which the kings all indicated their ascent. Meanwhile, at the doors of Priam's palace in the Acropolis of Ilium, the Trojans also held a meeting, but one that was marred by an outburst of bitterness. It was the able Antenor who started the trouble. Trojans, Dardanians and allies, he said, hear a proposal which I feel compelled to make. Let us have done now and give Argive Helen back to the Atreide, along with all her property. By fighting on as we are doing, we have made perjurers of ourselves. No good that I can see will ever come of that. We have no choice but to do as I say. With that, Antenor sat down, and Prince Paris, husband of the Lady Helen, leapt to his feet. He dealt bluntly with the man. Antenor, he said, I take exception to that speech of yours. You might have thought of something better, but if you mean what you say and seriously propose this move, the gods themselves must have addled your brains, and it is time for me to let the gallant Trojans know what I feel. I declare outright that I will not give up my wife. At the same time, I am willing to return all the goods I brought home with me from Argos and to add something of my own. Paris finished and sat down. He was followed by Dardanian Priam, who was as wise as the gods and now benevolently interposed. Trojans, Dardanians and allies, he said, listen to my advice. For the moment, take your supper in the town as usual, not forgetting to mount guard and the need for every man to keep alert. At dawn, let Idaeus go to the hollow ships and convey to my lords Agamemnon and Menelaus the offer we have heard from Paris, who started the quarrel. And there is another useful thing Idaeus can do. He can ask the Atreide whether they are willing to refrain from hostilities till we have burnt our dead. Later we will fight again and go on till the powers above decide between us. The king's advice was well received, and they acted on it. The soldiers took their supper in their several messes, and at dawn Idaeus took to the hollow ships, where he found, at dawn, Danon war chiefs in conference by the stern of Agamemnon's ship. He joined the circle and delivered his message with the clear enunciation of a herald. My lord Atreides and other princes of the United Achaeans, Priam and other Trojan lords, have instructed me to submit for your acceptance an offer made by Paris, who started our feud. All the property he brought away with him to Troy in his hollow ships, and would to God he had perished first, he is willing to return, with additions of his own. But he says that he will not give up my lord Menelaus's wife, though the Trojans have urged him to do so. Furthermore, 
I am instructed to ask whether you are willing to refrain from hostilities while we burn the dead. Afterwards we can fight on till the powers above decide between us. This pronouncement was received in complete silence by the Achaean chiefs. At last Diomedes of the loud war cry spoke. At this stage, he said, let no one think of accepting anything from Paris or of taking Helen either. Any fool can see that the Trojans' doom is sealed. The Achaean chieftains to a man applauded Diomedes, tamer of horses, and now King Agamemnon himself addressed the herald. Idaeus, he said, you have heard for yourself what the Achaeans think. You have their answer. I concur in it. The burning of the corpses is another matter. To that I raise no objection. When men are dead and gone, one cannot grudge them the boon of quick cremation. A truce, then, and let Zeus the Thunderer and Lord of Hera witness it. As he spoke, he lifted up his scepter for all the gods to see. Idaeus then withdrew and made his way back to sacred Ilium, where the Trojans and Dardanians had mustered and were all seated in conference awaiting the herald's return. When Idaeus reached them, he went to the center of the gathering and reported the result of his mission. Then they prepared themselves at once for their double task, some to bring in the dead and others to fetch wood, while on the other side parties of Argives were dispatched on the same duties from their well-found ships. The sun, climbing into the sky from the deep and quiet stream of ocean, had already lit the fields with the first beams when the Trojans and Achaean parties met. Even so, they found it difficult to recognize their dead before they had washed away the clotted blood with water. Then, as they lifted them onto the wagons, the hot tears flowed. King Priam had forbidden his men to cry aloud. So they heaped the corpses on the pyre in silent grief, and when they had consumed them in the flames, they went back to holy Ilium. So too on their side, the Achaean men-at-arms with heavy hearts piled up their dead on a pyre, and when they had burnt them in the flames, returned to their hollow ships. Before the following dawn, when the night still struggled with the day, a detachment of Achaean troops gathered by the pyre and set to work. Over the pyre, they made a single barrow with such material as the plain provided. Then, starting from this, they built a wall with high ramparts to protect the ships and themselves, fitting it with strong gates so that the chariots could pass in and out. Outside and parallel with the wall, they dug a deep trench, and along this broad and ample ditch, they planted a row of stakes. The long-haired Achaeans toiling at this task were observed by the gods. These sat down with Zeus, the lord of the lightning flash, and were watching the great work of the bronze-clad warriors with amazement. It was Poseidon, the earth shaker, who first voiced his feelings. Father Zeus, he said, is there nobody left in the wide world with the decency to inform us of his plans? Have you seen that the long-haired Achaeans have thrown a wall around their ships and dug a trench along it 
without offering the proper sacrifices to the gods. People will talk about this wall of theirs as far as the light of dawn is spread, and the wall that I and Phobos Apollo built with such labor for King Laomedon will be forgotten. Zeus, the cloud compeller, was indignant with him. Imperial Earthshaker, he said, your misgivings are absurd. Leave it to the other gods less powerful and resolute than you to be alarmed at this contraption. And rest assured that wherever the light of dawn is spread, yours is the name that will be held in honor. Besides, what will there be to stop you once the long-haired Achaeans have sailed for home? Why not break down the wall, scatter the fragments in the sea, and cover the long beach once more with sand? Then you could feel that the great Achaean works had been obliterated. While the gods were talking, the sun set, and the Achaeans finished their task. They slaughtered some oxen in the huts and took their supper. A number of ships had put in from Lemnos with cargoes of wine. They came from Unius, the son of Hypsidipal, had borne to Jason, the great captain, and he had included a thousand gallons in the consignment as a special gift for the Atridae. Agamemnon and Menelaus. From these, the long-haired Achaeans now supplied themselves with wine, some in exchange for bronze, some for gleaming iron, others for hides or live cattle, others again for slaves. It was a sumptuous meal that they sat down to. Right through the night, the long-haired Achaeans feasted themselves, while in the city the Trojans and their allies did the same. But all night long Zeus the thinker, brewing evil for them in their hearts, kept thundering ominously. Their cheeks turned pale with fear, and they poured wine on the ground from their cups. Not a man dared drink before he had made a libation to the almighty son of Kronos. But at last, they lay down and enjoyed the boon of sleep. <laughs>